Perhaps no word in all of Christendom evokes such an ethereal response, that cold, hard, twisting feeling in the stomach, like the word evangelism. The word evangelism. See, sadly, many people in the church, they hear the word evangelism, and the first thing that comes to their mind is this thought of going and cold knocking on somebody's door and standing there and just praying to God that they actually have pants on when they answer. (laughs) For some people, they think of evangelism, and they get this thought of walking up to a group of their friends and figuring out how you insert Jesus into a conversation about puppies. Or maybe you have this thought of, man, evangelism means I got to go stand on the corner and make one of those big scary signs that say turn or burn. Or maybe for you, somebody starts talking about evangelism and evangelists, and you get these thoughts of Billy Graham, and you think about, wow, Billy Graham preached to thousands. Or maybe you kick it up a notch, and you think of Reinhard Bonnke, and you think, my goodness, this man preached to hundreds of thousands of people, the masses, and you remember how you almost wet your pants when you were in high school, and you had to give a speech to 12 people, 11 of them who weren't even paying attention, And it makes you think, man, no, this isn't for me. No, evangelism isn't for me. I'm not an evangelist. I can't do this. This isn't the calling on my life. Well, today, here's what we're doing. We are continuing our journey in exploring Emmanuel's mission statement, which is, there we go, knowing Christ, loving people. And so Pastor Jason took the last few weeks to look at various ways that we could know Christ. We looked at knowing Christ. Today we are beginning week one in our emphasis on loving people. Loving people. See, love is not just words that are spoken, but it's actions that we take. The word of God, it says that for God so loved the world that he gave. In other words, God's love led him to take action. Led him to take action. God so loved the world that he gave. And so what we see is that love is not just words we speak, it's action we take. Love must lead to taking action. Loving people looks like something. Loving people looks like something. So similar to the idea of knowing Christ, we are going to take the next few weeks, starting today, to break down this idea of loving people. We're going to break it down into various topics, and we're going to look at different ways that we can love people. So we're going to discuss things like evangelism. We're going to look at discipleship. We're going to look at fellowship. We are going to look at discrete, actionable ways that we can love people. And so today we're going to start off with evangelism. And we're going to talk about how we can love people through sharing the good news of Christ with them. And my hope is by the end of the service, there will be people in here who may have apprehension, may have some fears when it comes to sharing their faith. That God's just going to take care of all of that. He's going to lift that off of you. And we're going to walk out of here with no fear when it comes to sharing our faith. So we're going to start with one of the quintessential sets of verses for both evangelism but also discipleship. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open them to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read verses 18 to 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so in Matthew 28, what we see is the resurrected Christ bringing his disciples together. And this is shortly before he is going to ascend back to heaven, and he brings his disciples together to give them their assignment, to give them their marching orders. Now, many people, when they talk about evangelism in this context, they start with verse 19. But I believe we actually need to start with verse 18. Because in verse 18, Jesus says that all authority has been given to me. Jesus says, All authority has been given to me. Consequently, if we are in Christ, then we have access to all of that authority. What I want you to see today is that if Christ has all authority, that means that the enemy has none. 
And Jesus makes it very clear. He says, all authority has been given to me in all areas. And so what we now know is that Satan no longer has authority in any place any longer. It's been taken back. The authority that Adam had handed over to Satan when he chose to eat that fruit in the garden was taken back when Christ died in humanity's place and rose again. We have the authority of Christ. We walk in the authority of Christ. But not only do we have the authority of Christ, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Jesus said in Acts 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. So the first thing today as we talk about evangelism that I want you to grasp is we have both the power and the authority in Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. We have the authority and the power to go do what Jesus has called us to do. That is something we currently possess. The authority of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is there to back you up. It's there to back you up. It's there to be there. The question is, do we ever put ourselves in a position where we actually need him to? So let me give you an example of this. I've had people that have come to me and they've said, Pastor Josh, I hear about this healing thing in the Bible, and I hear about it, and people talk about it, but I've never seen anybody healed. And the first question I will pose back to them is, how many people have you prayed for? Right? Or somebody can come, and they'll say, Pastor Josh, I hear about this evangelism thing and this witnessing thing, but I've never actually seen anybody come to Christ. I've never personally brought anybody to Christ. And my question back to them is, how many people have you actually witnessed? So a challenge for our lives, this is a challenge for the believer's life, is to live in a way that if God doesn't show up, it won't happen. If God doesn't show up, it just won't happen. It all falls apart. See, that's faith. See, when we step out only in what we can do in our own strength or what we can do and that's comfortable to us, comfortable to us that doesn't require faith. Right? That's living from knowledge and experience. And many believers live their entire lives from knowledge and experience. I've done this before and it's worked. I'm comfortable with this. And so I'm just going to keep on doing those things. See, it's only when we step out into something that we can't do in our own strength that we begin to live in the realm of faith. That's the realm we want to live in. We want to live a life of faith. And this is where the power and the authority of God is actually needed and where it shows up. Right, if we live a safe, comfortable life where we don't need the power of God, we don't need the authority of God, we may never see it actually activate through our lives. It's only when we step out into a situation where we actually need the power and the authority of God to come where he shows up. See, witnessing is spiritual warfare. I want to put that right before us today. Witnessing is spiritual warfare. There is a battle raging in this world right now for people's souls. There is a battle raging over the souls of people in this world. And so we had better come well-equipped. We better come ready to do battle with an enemy who desires only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Jesus said. He said the enemy comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That is Satan's one objective for this entire world is to steal, kill, and destroy. And we are called to be witnesses of the gospel, witnesses of the good news. See, we must let people know. We must preach the gospel message. We must proclaim the gospel message. Paul wrote in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of proclaiming the good news about Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. We must proclaim the gospel message. And this gospel message is not simply that you can say a prayer and go to heaven someday. The gospel message is that all the power of heaven is available to us today. The gospel is not escapism of I say a prayer and someday I go to heaven. The gospel is I can say a prayer, receive Jesus, and I can receive all of heaven. It's that heaven's resources are available to each and every one of us today. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died in our place, that he rose again and we can live too, and he is working to redeem and restore all that was lost when Adam disobeyed God and ate that fruit. We serve a God of restoration. We serve a God of redemption. We don't serve a God of escapism. 
It's not simply about getting to heaven someday. It's bringing earth. It's bringing heaven to earth today. It's not just I die someday and I get to go to heaven. No, heaven is here. Heaven is around us. If you've received Jesus, heaven lives inside of you. And now it's learning to release that power and that authority into the world in which we live. God has bigger plans for this world than I believe the church often does. He wants to do greater things than what I think we have in our minds. So we must proclaim this good news. And when we do, it is the very power of God to salvation. See, contained within the gospel message is the very power of God to bring people back to him. When you begin to proclaim about this amazing God, you begin to proclaim the good news that God wants to redeem, God wants to restore, God wants to have a relationship with you. All of the power of heaven comes to back you up and to make sure that that person knows that what you speak is true. When you proclaim the good news, when you proclaim the gospel, all of heaven is there to back you up, to testify that what you speak is true. So speak the truth. Heaven will back you up. We are in a battle, and we are called to proclaim the truth that will set people free. So now as it says in verse 19, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Now this verse would be better translated as having gone make disciples, or it could be translated as as you go make disciples of all nations. Go is not the verb in that actual sentence. So notice this is having gone, or it's as you go. This is what I believe is a key to successful evangelism. It's as we go evangelism. I like to call it lifestyle evangelism. Lifestyle evangelism. And now this is becoming more important than it ever has been in the history of the nation we live in. We live in a culture that is increasingly skeptical of large institutions, of institutions in general. And if you start talking to millennials and then you start talking to Generation Z, you will find that those generations are completely skeptical of this thing called the church. They've heard horror stories. They've seen all of these things. They're very skeptical of it. We live in a generation that's entirely turning skeptical to the message of the gospel. What I mean is this. You can throw a tent crusade, and it's not going to be anywhere near as successful as it would have been just 40 or 50 years ago. 40 or 50 years ago, you could set up a tent, get some music going in there, and people would flock to it. Today, you put a tent out there and put some music in there, people will walk by, give it a look, and probably keep going. We need to change with the times. We need to know what we're doing here. See, if you haven't noticed yet, unbelievers aren't exactly knocking down the doors of the church to get here. Right? Whoever got here this morning to unlock the doors, there wasn't a big long line of unbelievers waiting there just like, open the doors, let me in. Open the doors, I got to get in. If we haven't noticed that, they're not exactly knocking down the doors of the church to come in and hear about who Jesus is. But that's okay. That's all right, because even if they don't come to us, we can go to them. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying. It's exactly what he was saying. So the calling on our lives is to have deep encounters with God in our lives. What's that sound like? That sounds like knowing Christ. The calling on your life is to have deep encounters with God, both here and at your own personal times at home, having deep encounters with God so that we can take the presence of God to people and they can encounter God through our lives. See, somebody doesn't need to come to this building to have an encounter with God's presence. They should be able to encounter God's presence through your life and through mine. We should be so overflowing with the spirit and we should be so overflowing with the power of God and who he is that as we go forth, people encounter him through our very lives. So we must, we must have those encounters. This is called lifestyle evangelism. It's where we, during the normal course of life, look for opportunities each and every day and we intentionally build relationships with people to help them along on their journey. Now, I love outreach events. I really do. We have the egg hunt coming up soon. We need a lot of candy for that, just as a reminder. I love outreach events. They are a great supplement to a church that lives lifestyle evangelism. We have things like Let It Shine and Angel Tree, the egg hunt, the carnival we did in the summer. These are great opportunities to let our community know that we love them. But today I want to focus your heart not just on events, not just on these outreach style events, but I want to focus your heart on how we can live a lifestyle of reaching out to people. Because if you think about it, 
if we are focused solely on events, then we can share the gospel with people maybe five or ten times a year, depending on how many events we have. But if we live a lifestyle of evangelism, then we can share the gospel of pe with people 365 days a year, or in the case of this year, 366. You got a bonus day this year. We should be more fruitful. But as we go about our daily lives, we should be looking for opportunities to impact people for Christ. So in Christ, we have the authority and the power to see people brought into his kingdom. But we also have the responsibility. The responsibility. Let's check out 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. They'll throw it up on the wall there. It says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So God has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So what if you were to come to me and Pastor Jason is off today, but you would come to me and you would say, Pastor Josh, I have a message that I need you to relay to Pastor Jason. And you write it all out, you give it to me, and you say, can you give that to him? And I say, sure, I'll give that to him. Now imagine I go home, I put it down, I forget all about it, the message never gets to Pastor Jason. So he wouldn't know what you want him to know, and whose fault would it be? It would be mine. It would be mine. Similar to this world, God has chosen us to be the messengers, to be the ones that deliver his message of love, his message of hope, his message of redemption and restoration, his message that people can be reconciled back to a relationship with him. He has chosen us. It's not that God needs us, it's that God has chosen to use us. We'll talk about that in a little bit. He has chosen to use us. We are the carriers of the message of reconciliation. It's not angels. Angels are not called to go forth and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is you and I, those made in the very image of God. These verses tell us that we are heaven's ambassadors. That's a very important thing to get down. Do you know what an ambassador is? If you don't know what an ambassador is, it is this. It's an official representative that represents one country while living in another. Right? So the Chinese ambassador, he lives in the United States. He's not a United States citizen. He's a Chinese citizen. But he lives in the United States, and he is here to represent China's interests to the United States. He's here on behalf of China. Now, what does that mean if we are heaven's ambassadors? Though we live in the United States, we are citizens of another kingdom. We are citizens of heaven. And we are called to represent that kingdom and its interest to the world in which we live. We are called to represent heaven's interests. Though we live in the United States, we are citizens of heaven. And we are called to proclaim the, the interests of heaven to the world in which we live, to every person that we come into contact with. See, we are called to represent Christ to this world. We are representatives of Christ. Think about that word, represent. Break it down. Represent, represent. In other words, our lives should be so transformed with who Christ is. This is God's desire, that our lives would be so transformed and overflowing with who Christ is that we go out into this world and we represent Jesus to them. That when they look at our lives, they say, my goodness, that person looks a lot like this Jesus guy that I read about in the Bible. That our lives are so overflowing with who Christ is that we represent him to the world in which we live. So we are given the power and the authority to be Christ's witnesses. We are given the assignment and the responsibility. And we are also given the privilege. The privilege. The privilege of being his witnesses. Now, I know for some people that are very shy or maybe they're introverted or witnessing is really tough for them, they may be like, my goodness, how can you call something that's so scary a privilege? How can you say that it's a privilege to go do something that's so incredibly scary? Well, let me put it like this. There is nothing more important than knowing Christ and making him known. There is nothing more important in all of this world than knowing Christ 
and making him known. See, making Christ known to this world, evangelism, is truly worth living for. This is truly worth living for. The question we should ask ourselves is, am I living my life for something that is truly valuable? Am I living my life for something that's truly valuable? See, we have limited time on this earth. None of us know how long it's going to last. We have limited days here on this earth. So I suspect that all of us want to make them count. Is there anybody here who wants to live a completely non-meaningful life and just waste it all away? I don't think there's anybody. We all want to live a life of meaning and purpose. So if we want to do that, then we should use our lives use our life, use the days we have on this earth to impact things that are valuable. So the question is, what is most valuable? What is most valuable? And it's a very simple thing. Look to the person beside you. It's people. It's people. You ask me, Pastor Josh, what is truly valuable? It is one thing. It is people. Now, don't get too spiritual here. I know some people would be like, oh, jeez. Don't don't get super spiritual here with that, right? On this earth, the things that are here, in creation, there is one thing that is valuable, and it is people. It is people. People are incredibly valuable. Follow along with me here. The value of something is always determined by the price someone is willing to pay for it. You understand? So an example of this, let me give you an example. You may have some old, junker, rusty, beaten up car, And you may say, you know what, I want to sell this car. And you may go and you throw it up on eBay, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to sell this car for $25,000. Right? Your old, rusty, beat-down car. Here's the thing. If you put your, you can price your car at $25,000, but if somebody is only willing to pay you $1.50 for that car, guess what? The value of your car is $1.50. Because the value of something is determined by the price someone is willing to pay for it. If that is the case, follow with me here, if that is the case, if the price someone is willing to pay determines the value of something, then what does it say about the value of people that God was willing to pay the very price of his son to redeem them? The value of something is determined by the price someone is willing to pay. And if people were valued at the price of Jesus, that tells you that they are eternally, they are infinitely valuable. They are eternally valuable. They are eternally valuable in the eyes of God. People and their souls are going to last forever in one of two places. It's a reality that should smack us in the face this morning. See, homes and cars and phones and TVs, all of these things may be quite expensive, but in reality, they're not valuable. They're expensive, but they're not valuable. So we should be motivated to make what is truly valuable the priority of our lives. We should be motivated to make people our priority, to be better fathers and mothers, to be better grandparents, to be better friends, to be better sons and daughters, and to be better witnesses. And to be better witnesses. To be better witnesses. There is nothing more valuable to dedicate your life to than bringing people who are lost back to their loving Heavenly Father. When you do, you make a difference that will last into all of eternity. All of eternity. You can impact eternity. See, cars and homes and possessions, they're all going to fade away. I promise you, we're not going to sit around in heaven someday and be like, hey, what kind of car did you drive on earth? How many square feet was your house once again? Which iPhone did you have? Oh, you only had the nine. Oh. Don't get iPhones. That's my plug. Sorry for those who love them. But we're not going to sit around in heaven someday and compare possessions, right? But what we are going to see is we are going to see people. And I want to live my life in a way that I can point to people and I can say that that person and that person is here at least in part because of the way that I chose to live my life. That I gave my life to impact them for Christ impacting people for Christ is one of the greatest privileges we will ever know. If you want to live a life of meaning and true purpose, there it is. Find ways to impact people for Christ. Find people who don't know Christ and let them know. If you want to live a life that's meaningful, dedicated to impacting people for Christ. Now what I want to point out is that 
that may not be the safe thing. That may not be the comfortable thing. Right? And people live their entire lives thinking that the gospel message is all about safety and comfort. If that was the case, then Jesus wouldn't be sending people into Iran and China and other places around the world right now. God's not so much concerned about your safety and comfort as he is giving you a life of meaning and value and purpose. He wants to give you a life that's meaningful. He wants to give you a life that impacts eternity, impacts what will last forever. He's not so concerned with our safety this morning, and thank God for that. He's, he's more concerned with us living a life that's meaningful, that's meaningful. So let me recap. We're given an assignment and the responsibility. We are given the power and the authority, and we are given the privilege. But now I want to get a little bit practical with you today. Because the greatest theology in the world doesn't actually reach people for Christ unless it's put into practice. So let me ask a question. If you want to do it with a show of hands, feel free. How many of you in this room today feel completely, totally, 100% comfortable with going out and sharing your faith with anybody? You could go up to any stranger at any time and just tell them all about Jesus. Is there anybody like that today? If that's you, just raise your hand. And there are a few. Absolutely. Brother Danny, we know, of course. That's, that's we know that one. That's, that's taken for granted. But did you notice something? The vast majority of the hands weren't raised. My hand wasn't raised. Right? As much as I can do something like this, I'm somewhat introverted when it comes to meeting new people. I'm somewhat introverted when it comes to that. What you should see and what you should be encouraged with is the vast majority of people don't feel totally 100% comfortable at all times sharing their faith with all people. We always have these thoughts, right? We go forth and we have these fears and these doubts. Well, what do I say? What if they ask me something I don't know? What if they reject me? We can get pretty irrational, right? We can even get, well, I better not go talk to them because I don't know enough, and if I tell them the wrong thing, they may go to hell. Right? We get really irrational with these things. And it's okay if witnessing doesn't come naturally to you as long as you don't use that as an excuse to not do what Christ has called us to do. See, that word evangelize, it's scary. Right? It scares a lot of people. I think in one part it is because so many have this mindset of, well, I need to get people saved. I need to get people saved. Evangelism is about getting people saved. I've got to get people saved. I've got to get people saved. Well, let me take the pressure off of you today. You can't save anyone. You can't save anyone. You couldn't even save yourself. You couldn't even save you. I couldn't save me. We're not called to save anyone. What we are called to do is to be witnesses. And a witness tells people what they have seen. You call a witness in a case, in a court. What do they do? They say, tell me what you saw. We are called to tell people what we have seen. Tell people what we've seen in our lives, what Christ has done for us. Tell people the truth that they need to hear. Love people with the love of Christ. We're called to help people along on their journey toward Christ by showing them and telling them about who Christ is and what that means for their life. What that means for their life. See, for every single person who comes to Christ, and can you go ahead and throw that slide up? With the chains, the links, there it is. For every single person who comes to Christ, there are a series of events, interactions, teachings, and truths that bring them closer to the decision point. I want you to think of it like chain links. If you're in the evangelism course, we talked about this. We're going to break it down this morning. And what I want you to see is on the left side, this is before people come to Christ. This is before they come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And then there is a journey that they go upon. Every single person that's come to Christ has gone on this journey, and I want you to see the right side to where they finally have come to accept Jesus as their Savior. So for every person who comes to Christ, there is a series of events and interactions and teachings and people praying for them that brings them closer to that decision point. See, each time that they hear the truth, or each time that they're shown the love of Christ, or they see how Christ has positively affected somebody's life, it's like adding a link to the chain that brings them a little bit closer to coming to receiving Jesus. 
something positive happens. You come and witness to them. They may not fall down on their knees and receive Jesus, but you have a great interaction with them. You speak truth into their lives, and it adds another link to that chain that brings them a little bit closer to knowing who Jesus is. It brings them a little bit closer to that point where they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. See, our objective in evangelism is to be somebody who adds links to people's chains. To be people who add links to people's chains that bring them closer to the way that we accept, to the point where they accept Christ. Right? This is through the way we act. This is through witnessing. This is through praying for them. This is how I want you to view your role in sharing your faith with people. We want to be people that add links to people's chains that bring them closer to a decision point for Christ. And what you'll see is that some people's chains are really short. Some people, for whatever reason, they hear the gospel message, the Holy Spirit's working, they open their hearts, they receive Jesus very quickly. That's awesome. That's fun. Right? We all like that. If you ever prayed for like a brother, sister, mom, dad, children, you know that that's the preferred method. So some are chains are very short. They receive Christ more quickly. But what we also know is that some people's chains are very long. Some people's chains are very long, and there is a battle and a process that takes place to bring them to that point where they receive Christ. Some people may have been really hurt by the church, or they may have been hurt by somebody who claimed to be a believer when they were young. And now there's going to be a long process of healing and a long process of people coming alongside of them and showing them that that person really wasn't representing Jesus. And it may be a long chain, and it may take a long time to bring them to a decision point. Now what we should realize here is that sometimes we're the last link. So see that beautiful blue link on the right side? Sometimes we are the last link in this chain, and we have the opportunity to pray with them to receive Christ. That's an awesome thing. That's amazing. But recognize that for most people, there are many links that brought them to that decision point, and every single one of those links is just as important as the other. See, as a pastor, I have a privilege of giving altar calls, and there's times where people respond to that altar call. And I have the opportunity, what an incredible privilege, to be that blue link on the right side. But I fully recognize that for the vast majority of those people that come forward to receive Christ, that I have the opportunity to pray with, there were other believers that came along in their lives and added the red chain and the green chain and the yellow chain and then another blue one. I recognize that there were many things that led to that point. So every single one of those links in the chain is just as important as the other because one link broken destroys a chain. Now, this should alleviate some of the pressure on you. This should alleviate a lot of pressure on you. And Tara, if you're back, can you come, Sister Tara? This should alleviate some of the pressure on you because now we don't just measure success by whether we got somebody to pray a prayer to receive Jesus, but success in evangelism becomes, did we move them closer to Christ? Did we bring them a little bit closer to Christ? This is the proper mindset for witnessing. The proper mindset for witnessing. See, a few years ago, I had a conversation with somebody. I won't name the person. And I had a conversation with them after we had taken the youth out on what Sarah and I call treasure hunting. It's this whole amazing thing, right? Treasure hunting. You ask God for words of knowledge. You take those words of knowledge. They lead you to people. You go up to people and say, hey, you look like what we have on our list here. Can we pray for you? And so I'm talking to this person about how we had gone out treasure hunting with the youth. And this person looked at me and they say, well, how many of them accepted Christ? And I said, okay. And I said, well, this is really exciting. We got to witness to over 10 people tonight. We got to witness to a self-proclaimed Wiccan and tell her that Jesus loves her. Now on that night, nobody fell on their knees and prayed a sinner's prayer. And that person looked at me and they said, well, what's the point then? What's the point then? See, evangelism, I believe, has been so ineffective because it's been taught as getting people to pray the sinner's prayer. And sometimes what happens then is we go out and we pressure people to pray this prayer. They're not ready to receive Jesus, but we're putting this pressure on them about you need Jesus and you don't want to go to hell and all of these things. And because of that pressure, they go, all right, I'll pray some prayer. Or maybe we go out and we're in their face so much that they go, my goodness, I'll just say the words this person's saying so they shut up and leave me alone. And what happens is it's completely ineffective because it's not actually faith on their part that leads them into salvation. See, we want people to, like Jesus said, count the cost. 
See, I don't want to go forth witnessing and doing evangelism and getting people to say some prayer just so I can put another notch in my belt and be like, yeah, I got three people to say a prayer tonight. I don't want fake conversions. I don't want people just praying a prayer because they feel pressure or they're scared. I want people to count the cost and truly be ready to receive Jesus. Now, if you go forth and it is their time to receive Christ, if you are the last link, then you pray with them and you lead them into the kingdom. But if it's not, then we love them, we bless them, and we believe that if God led us, led us to them, then he's going to lead other people to them so that he can continue to work in their lives. And so we celebrate that God used us to bring them just a little bit closer. I don't want this fake stuff anymore. I don't want notches in my belt. I want people to have the authentic encounter with God. I want them to count the cost so that when the troubles and difficulties come a few days later, they don't go, well, that wasn't anything. Right? We pressure people into making these decisions sometimes. That's not evangelism. That's manipulation. We want people to have an authentic encounter with Christ. We're adding chains to people's links. So you may not think you're making an impact in someone's life. It may not seem like you're, not, you're making any sort of difference, but you may be adding links to their chain. You may be frustrated this morning because you try and you try and you've witnessed and you've prayed and you've done all of these things and it seems like it's not going anywhere. But maybe, just maybe, you've added enough links to their chain that someone else is going to come along, add one more, and they'll receive Christ. Or maybe one more time of you witnessing to them and sharing the love of Christ will be that last link in the chain that brings them to him. Don't give up this morning. Don't give up this morning. This is the calling on our lives to be people who add links. We are chain makers. We are chain makers. See, this is awesome because this means you don't have to be some great, outspoken, fearless evangelist standing on the street corner impacting people for Christ. God's called you to do that. Go do it. That's awesome. But you don't have to. You don't have to. You can be you. That's freeing this morning. You can be you. In fact, don't try to be somebody else because God made you uniquely you. And so it's actually an affront to God when you try to be somebody else. Because he's made you beautifully who you are. He's made you perfectly who you are. You are God's masterpiece. So don't be like anyone else. Now, what I don't want you to do is to hide behind excuses of, well, I'm shy or I'm an introvert, so I can't do this. No, this is for all of us this morning, right? So don't hide behind any excuses, but you go out and you be you, but you be somebody who adds links to people's chains. See, a key to all of this is intentionality. Intentionality. We want to be intentional in reaching out to people. Right, there's a quote that's attributed to St. Francis. It says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now, I get what is being said, right? that our lives should be a testimony of who Christ is, that people should be able to look at our lives and see Christ. That is absolutely true, but I would propose to you today that this quote should really be, preach the gospel with our lives and preach the gospel with our words, because people may see your life, but they may not ask. They may not know. They may just think that you in and of yourself are some great person, which we're not, right? We know that without Christ, we're all in trouble. So we want to preach the gospel with our lives, but we want to preach the gospel with our words. See, let's be intentional. If you're a teacher, let me give you some examples. If you're a teacher, pray for your students. Pray for your students. Look for ways that you can speak into their lives. You could be grading a paper. You could have a conversation with them, and you could prophetically call something out of their lives that will impact them forever. There was a story about a year ago about a teacher who wrote on the top of a student's paper, invite me to your Harvard graduation, and 21 years later, that student did just that. You don't tell me that that teacher didn't change that student's life by simply writing that on top of that paper. If you're a businessman or you're a businesswoman, your role is to bring God to the place of your business. Your role is to find ways that you can use your business to impact people for the kingdom. You could be a mechanic this morning. You should run your business with integrity. You should run your business as a place where God's presence saturates. You should ask God each day, how can I help somebody out today, God? God. If you're a student here today, your goal is to take the light of Jesus to your friends in your school. 
They'll never kick God out of school because he lives inside of students that go there every day. He lives inside of teachers that go there every day. I want to smash my head against the wall when people put something up on Facebook about how they kick God out of school. No, you can't kick God out of school. He's everywhere. You can try, but you won't be successful. He's everywhere. And he lives inside of students and teachers that go there every day. You may be older. You may be retired. Well, I bet most of you have children and grandchildren. I know in here we have people with great-grandchildren. As you go through the day, ask God to show you how you can impact them. You may go out into the marketplace during the week. Ask God to give you an opportunity to share. Be intentional. Be mindful as you go through the day. And ask God to show you these opportunities. I promise they're there every day. We just miss them. We just miss them. Let me give you a very easy example. At the gym I go to, from time to time, you have people that come there and they have some sort of brace on, right? Some sort of brace. And I can tell you that there's been multiple times that I've had an opportunity to speak into people's lives because I simply walk up and go, hey, what happened? People like to tell you what happens. Right? People like to talk about themselves. Right? It's a very simple question. Hey, what happened? People love to tell you how they got an injury or something going on. And that simple what happened can lead to an opportunity to speak truth into their life. It can lead to a conversation. It can lead to an opportunity to pray for them. Very simple things. We're adding links to people's chain. See, each and every day, the story of people's lives are being written. Every day. I want you to see people's lives like a story that's being written every day. They wake up in the morning and a new page begins and the story of their life begins. The next day comes, you flip a page. The story of their life is being written day by day by day. A new page every day. See, my desire is that God would use me to insert a new page into their story. One that forever changes the plot of their lives. One that changes every chapter in that book from that moment forward. I want God to use me to insert a new page into their story. Each and every day. One that they can look back on one day and say, I was going through life. I was in the thick of it. But then this person came and they showed me God's love. Or this person came and they told me there's a God that loved me. Or this person came and they prayed for me. They listened to me when I was struggling. They helped me financially. They watched my kids so I could go out with my husband. They cooked me a meal. They mowed my grass. Whatever it is, be somebody that inserts a page into the story of people's lives that changed the plot of that story forever. Church, we are the call to be the ones to bring this amazing message to the world. See, God has given us the assignment and the responsibility. We are called, and those that he calls, he equips. So he's given us the power and the authority. And he's also given us this wonderful privilege. The privilege of playing a part in the greatest story and the greatest mission that this world will ever know. I ask you this morning, who will you impact with? Who will you point to in heaven someday and say that that person is here at least in part because of the way that I live my life? Because God used me to add links to their chain. Who will you point to in heaven someday? This is lifestyle evangelism. This isn't getting up the courage every day to, oh, I'm going to go do this. It's simply being who God created us to be. It's going forth and letting people know that there's a God that loves them. It's part of our lifestyle today. It should be. And as we live our lives, we share our faith. We let others know what God has done in our lives and what he can do in theirs. So here's what I want to do today. I want to put food to our faith. In my prayer time this morning, I believe with all my heart that God was saying he wants to release a special grace this morning. A grace to be witnesses for who he is. And I believe that as people respond this morning, God is going to release the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, you'll receive power and you will be my witness. I believe that God around these altars this morning wants to release the power of the Holy Spirit into your life so that you can be witnesses of him this morning. So I'm calling people forth today to stand before God and say, just like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. No more send my pastor, no more send my friends, no more send this person. It's here I am, Lord Jesus, send me. Send me. And I believe as we respond this morning, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come to change us and prepare us to be witnesses.
to change people's hearts, to give them courage to do what perhaps you've never done before. And so that's what we're going to do. If you can go ahead and stand.